Welcome to 15 Minutes of Fangs and Folklore with your host, Matthew Miller. We give you pint-sized, bite-sized pieces of supernatural monster lore, exploring their origins, their history, and their meaning to the human condition. Listen, if you dare. What were you doing 12 years ago? Can you even remember? If you're like me, maybe you were living in a different place, doing something different with your life, maybe a different job, a different place in your life, emotionally, mentally, maybe even a very different person than who you are today. That's because 12 years is a long time. Now imagine that for the period of 12 years, all of those years, you'd been tormented by an evil spirit, an evil spirit who just wouldn't stop harassing you and your family, and your home, trying to ruin your life. I'm your host, Matthew Miller, expert on all things monster and paranormal. I'm a horror writer from the dark and haunted swamps of Louisiana, and it's my pleasure to welcome you into my terrifying world. Please check out my books on Amazon, beginning with Blood Feud, a punk rock vampire story. It's the first in the Gravedigger series. The Gravediggers are a punk rock band who keep running across these horrible, dark, evil, nasty creatures, beasties. It's horror and comedy in one super entertaining series. Volumes 1 through 3 are out, 4 is coming very soon, and it's a six-part series total. This is a very special episode of Fangs in Folklore for two reasons. First of all, as you can see, I've moved the studio into a deserted castle that I found in the countryside. I found this basement dungeon room. Um, I'm not sure what that is on the wall, but, but hopefully it'll be okay. And then also, it's very special because it's the first time I'm attempting to do a video and an audio version of the same tape in one cut. (laughs) So wish me well. That way, my amazing fans and listeners can choose to listen to the podcast, as always, or check out the video on YouTube for some enhanced material, including some photos. Please bear with me if I make some mistakes, because it's my first try doing this. Have mercy. 63 Wycliffe Road, Battersea, South London. It's another famous address among paranormal enthusiasts and investigators. The house itself no longer exists. It was torn down. These days, a nondescript, perfectly lovely group of semi-detached houses and row houses sit in the general area on the quiet street in a gentrified Battersea where the incident occurred. In the 1950s, though, it was a poor, working-class neighborhood. The exact spot of the house now is basically just a little section of street. At that time, the house was inhabited by the Hitchings family. The family included Wally, who was the father. He was a a train driver for the London Underground. His wife, Kitty. Their daughter, Shirley, who was 15 years old. Wally's mother, Ethel. And a young man named John. John apparently was either Wally and Kitty's or Ethel's adopted son. And it looks like uh, that Shirley considered him like a brother but maybe called him Mark in her journals for some reason. That's, that's hard to understand that particular part, but there was another guy there who was a part of the family. You can already see that uh, the poltergeist occurs in a family with a pubescent person, as almost always. If you've been following the podcast series of Poltergeist, 15 Minutes of Fangs and Folklore, you know that it's very common, in fact, almost standard for a poltergeist to bother a family with a pubescent person in the mix. And so this poltergeist became obsessed with Shirley and picked on her. Shirley, by the way, was by all appearances a, a nice, normal girl, a working class family, nothing special, either you know, the good side or bad side about her, just a, a nice, decent girl. And she had aspirations to go to art school. She liked to draw. She also worked part-time as a seamstress at a department store called Selfridges. One evening in 1956, Shirley found under her pillow a silver key out of nowhere. She showed her parents. Her father tried it out on every door in the house. It didn't fit anywhere in the house. The key would soon disappear and never be found again. That same night, a banging began from the house, which came from like out of thin air. 
And it was <clears throat> so loud, the neighbors thought that while he was doing construction work or tearing up his floorboards, people in the street could hear it. It was that loud. And the neighbors came over and you know said, what are you doing in the middle of the night? It happened the next night too, and the next night after that, and it began happening during the day as well. Along with the banging, there were scratches, the sound of scratching coming from inside the walls and seemingly from furniture. And you'll remember then that this is the stereotypical beginning of a poltergeist case. Almost always they begin with scratches and then uh, bangings. This family, by the way, had lived through the Blitz, the German bombing of London in World War II, and they compared the noise level of this banging to, the, to that, to the bombs. I mean, the whole neighborhood could hear it, and there's no obvious source of it. I'd like to comment briefly on this noise making. You remember the German word poltergeist means a rumbling or loud or noisy spirit? And I mentioned in a, in a previous podcast that poltergeists seem to act like spoiled or naughty teenagers looking for attention. You know, it, it, that's really what they want is attention. Uh, Sharon O'Keefe, who is a psychology professor from Bucks New University in the UK, says, The argument from some parapsychology theorists is that it's about attention. We're seeing effectively a ghost with a tantrum, close quote. Just like in the infield poltergeist haunting from the last episode, the family called the police. Police heard the sounds themselves, could not explain them. They even called in, at one point, land surveyors to see if there was a problem with the foundation of the house or the land underneath. Was it marshy? Was the house sinking? Was, there, you know, was it that the cause of it? But no, there was no, no evidence of that. As with most poltergeist cases, the noises led then to objects moving by themselves. In this Battersea case, this included, and remember all of this happened in front of many witnesses, clocks floating through the air, pots and pans being thrown out of rooms that were confirmed empty, no people were in the rooms, <clears throat> chairs and furniture moving around on their own, bed sheets pulled off of beds while people were in them. Shirley, by the way, was thrown more than once out of bed by an unseen force. At first she was confused, thought, Maybe I'm just tired and imagine this throughout again and again and again. Slippers walking around, slippers walking around by themselves. That's creepy to me. It's very uncanny because you have to imagine is someone in them. So that, that one really creeps me out. <clears throat> Shirley levitated above her bed. Levitation very common for poltergeist hauntings. The stereotypical puddle of clear unidentified liquid appeared. This is very common in poltergeist cases to have a puddle or several of this kind of viscous syrup-like clear uh, liquid and when analyzed it smells faintly of urine and it, it contains some urine but it also contains some unknown organic matter as well as some water there were cold spots and breezes without explanation also very common in the poltergeist haunting matches caught fire spontaneously various objects caught fire sometimes in different rooms at the same time in fact the father wally actually had a burn wound from trying to put a fire out if you remember, I made the claim that no poltergeist that I've ever read about has directly and truly physically harmed a person, although in many cases they've set in motion things that have hurt a person. Um, for example, this, you know, fire. The poltergeist didn't set Wally on fire out of nowhere, but set something on fire that ended up hurting Wally. In the Bell Witch case, poltergeist, the poltergeist actually killed a man, but again, not directly. What the poltergeist did, she claimed to have replaced his medicine with poison. And so I maintain that although people have received scratches, slaps, pinches, pokes, no poltergeist has ever truly directly harmed someone, like done them long-term harm physically or killed them directly. And as I, in this case also, there were scratches on the skin of many people, slapping, pinching, poking by unseen hands. The Hitching family took to calling the entity Donald because on the Disney character, right, Donald Duck, because Donald Duck is loud and obnoxious and often angry, so they named him Donald. <clears throat> Donald would force his will upon Shirley. For example, he liked to tell her to wear her hair a certain way and threaten to, to you know, burn the house down if she wouldn't do it that way. So uh, it had a huge interest in Shirley. Donald, the poltergeist, was obsessed with a handsome young actor named Jeremy Spencer. In 1956, Donald wrote a letter. I'll get more to that later. Yes, he wrote letters to Shirley saying that she had to meet the actor Jeremy Spencer personally or else harm would come to the actor. Oddly, Spencer got in a car accident around that time and she didn't meet him. Donald wrote lots of letters and notes. In fact, over 3,000 in total. 
At the most active period of the haunting, the entity was writing like 60 notes per day average. While Donald focused on tormenting Shirley, the 15-year-old girl, it also messed with her grandmother, Ethel. More than once, it tried to push her down the stairs. It also mocked her, kind of. It imitated her deceased mother's Irish voice, causing Ethel to, to break down and cry. This is the voice coming out of the air. So it taunted her also. And then keep in mind that this is the most famous poltergeist case in British history, maybe in the world. And there were countless witnesses to all of this. It's not just Shirley alone claiming these things. It got so bad that the house was turned upside down in chaos, basically. Evelyn Hollow, who uh, is a paranormal investigator and writer from Scotland, was there. Uh, she said, quote, rooms are trashed. The house must have looked like a bloody war zone. It's truly a wild case, close quote. Now, the Battersea Poltergeist case is indeed unusual in a few ways that distinguish it from your more run-of-the-mill or everyday poltergeist infestation. I <laughs> hope they're not actually that common, but... Yeah, the, the normal ones. So what are these things? First, <clears throat> the poltergeist began speaking in a disembodied voice, separate and apart from Shirley herself talking, and it talked a lot. Okay? It scribbled on the walls, and it even wrote a note in Shirley's notebook that simply said, Shirley, I come. There are pictures of the note and the wall writing, and looking at the wall writing as a linguist, someone with a master's degree in languages, and I've read manuscripts in many languages, I'm not sure what the writing's supposed to say. It, one of them looks like long scribble lines and, and an incomplete tic-tac-toe game with X's in it. Another one clearly is meant to be Roman letters. It could say una franca, which in Latin could mean a French woman. Keep that in mind. Um, another wall group, another wall writing group, looks almost like Arabic, but not really Arabic. It's almost like Arabic using weird versions of Greek letters. I have no idea what any of it is supposed to say, actually. It, it, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's non-translatable. You can read it, you can look at the letters, but you, no one knows what it actually said. This poltergeist actually followed Shirley around. It followed her to work, even uh, made some scissors. That, remember, she's a seamstress, made some scissors disappear, six or seven pairs of scissors. At work, it made all sorts of tapping noises, which scared, of course, the other employees terribly. The company of, uh, accused Shirley of stealing the scissors, but they searched her, found nothing. And they eventually sacked her, fired her, because uh, it was scaring all the other employees and because they didn't want their business associated with a haunting, as you might imagine. <clears throat> Shirley was interviewed by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, about the case. And while they were sitting and waiting for the show to begin, she, she and her father... Everyone there, including BBC employees, heard tapping noises with no explanation. Donald apparently was, was going to appear on the radio or on TV. He didn't, but he did right before they started recording or filming. And everyone there, including the BBC people, heard it. Now, get this. I've said before that the average poltergeist haunting only lasts two or three months. Many people are surprised to hear that because you watch movies and it makes it sound different. But two or three months is the average poltergeist haunting. The Battersea Poltergeist case lasted 12 years. As far as I know, it's the longest in history on record. Just imagine the psychological toll on the family. Shirley, you know, that's her teenage years and her young adult years taken over by this, this evil entity who harassed her. Now, you know it's not unique for a poltergeist to claim to be the ghost of a, of a dead person. In fact, it's common. But what makes this case interesting is who the entity claimed to be. This is fascinating. Donald claimed that he was the ghost of Louis Charles, who was the son of King Louis XVI of France and his wife Marie Antoinette, who were famously beheaded during the French Revolution. So when the French Revolution comes and they realize their lives are in danger, this, this is true in history. They hid their son away for his safety. The Dauphin, that's the word, the French word for a future prince, the Dauphin, uh, they hid him away. His story was basically lost to history. No one knows what really happened to him. Many historians today believe that Louis Child died in prison. Uh, there's a conspiracy theory that some other boy replaced him in prison, swapped out, and, and he escaped. No one really knows what happened to him, but he's a real historical character. Now, Donald the Poltergeist claimed that he was the ghost of Louis Child, that uh, when the French Revolution happened, he had been rescued by a man named Count Hensdorf, who had hidden him on a sheep farm in Switzerland, 
and then had arranged a ship to sail him to England for his safety. The ship, when crossing the English Channel, uh, was, was overturned, got into a shipwreck, and the boy drowned. That's Donald's story. That's not historical, that part. That's Donald's story. In fact, paranormal investigator Harold Chibbett, who was a pretty well-known ghost hunter of the time in England, he wrote a letter to Donald, care of the Hitchings family. He mailed it. And get this, he received a typed three-page reply mailed to him claiming to be from Donald. A typed reply. I can't read the entire reply here, but, but I did read it myself. It basically tells the story of the boy being rescued, taken to the sheep farm, drowning. What is fascinating to me is that it names the Dauphin's bodyguards. Historians later confirmed that the names were correct. The language of the letter was English. It was written in English, but with lots of quirks and weird mistakes. The mistakes would seem to be those that a native French speaker might make when trying to write in English. But I, your faithful host, who happens to have a master's degree in French and to teach French at the university level, uh, I say that only to say that I read the letter, and for many reasons, many linguistic reasons, too many to go into right now, and they'd bore you anyway, my own assessment is that it is the writing of someone who does not know French very well, but who's pretending to be a native French speaker writing in English, you see. That's my professional assessment. Moreover, a prince, you know, a prince, a dauphin, their French would have been highly elevated, a high register of language, very educated. But the Frenchisms, if you would, in this letter, uh, attempting to mimic it, they're not very highly educated. They're like the writings of a peasant or something, like it would be. So the letter clearly is, is not a native French speaker. It's someone pretending to be a native French speaker who's writing in English. Okay? In fact, this letter is one of the things that skeptics look at in trying to assess whether the poltergeist, uh, Battersea poltergeist haunting really occurred or was just a hoax by Shirley. Shirley herself could type. Never in any case in history has a poltergeist typed letters before. Then again, how could Shirley have known the name of Louis Charles's bodyguards when, when no one knew that? It had to be researched later. As for pretending to be a native French speaker, yeah, it could be something a teenage girl might try to pull off as a joke. But also, poltergeists are known liars, right? They're always lying about who they are. So that's just really interesting. Now, some big-name researchers became involved in this case. I mentioned Harold Chibbett, who was a well-known paranormal investigator, ghost hunter of the time. He was maybe like the Zach Bagans of 1950s England. He spent extensive time in the house and claimed to have personally witnessed all sorts of uh, phenomena, supernatural stuff, furniture moving, the voice, and so forth. He entered a question-and-answer session with Donald, the one where, you know, like, knock once for yes, twice for no, that kind of thing. And it was there that Donald claimed to be this boy prince, Louis Charles, his ghost. <clears throat> the Society for Psychical Research also investigated the case. This society is founded in 1882. It still exists, and they have a Facebook page, in fact. And it tries to take kind of a scientific approach in investigating paranormal activity and keeps historical records of the cases. And they, too, agreed that supernatural activity was occurring. Harry Hanks, a psychic medium, was tempted to establish contact with Donald in a seance. I couldn't find any information on what happened during the seance. There's a photograph of it, but I didn't find any details about what actually happened. So presumably he, he, didn't, presumably he did not contact Donald. The BBC, the British Broadcasting uh, Corporation, interviewed Wally and Shirley, as I mentioned above. In fact, just about every tabloid and several real newspapers visited the house and wrote stories about it. And then the sheer number of people who witnessed the phenomena over a stunning 12-year period makes this one of the most, if not the most, documented hauntings in history. Okay. Now, Shirley resented Donald. She uh, These days, she's 80 years old around this time, maybe 80, 81, something, but she's, she's in her 80s. She said in a recent interview that she's not angry toward Donald, but she added, quote, but he did take away my teenage years and young adulthood, and I can't forgive him for that, close quote. Now, you might think 12 years of torment, how did it all end? I've mentioned before that poltergeist cases end in uh, basically uh, one of three ways. Either one, the person under torment moves away out of the house. Two, an exorcism of some sort drives it out. Or three, it kind of just stops. In this case... Shirley did move out of the house, but it didn't stop. It was only till later, when she was married with her own child living in West Sussex, that in 1968, she called her father, Wally, 
He said, told her that Donald had left a note in the house. The note simply said, quote, my work is done. Goodbye. Close quote. And after the note that uh, the ordeal ended after that note, what was his work? That's, that's creepy to me. Tormenting them. Two things later happened to Shirley that may or may not be associated with Donald. In the 1980s, she was at a craft fair of some sort. A woman walked up to her and said, I'm a, I'm a psychic, a medium. I can see ghosts. And there is a little boy ghost following you, following you around. He was, quote, a little boy in fancy dress, blue satin, and he's got red hair, close quote. And in fact, that's the very description of Louis Charles on a postcard that Harold Chibbett had once shown Shirley. Very recently, uh, Shirley was with her daughter at some kind of a psychic meeting. I'm not sure the details, but a meeting of psychics. One of the psychics gave her a message from the beyond that said, quote, from a boy who said he was sorry for all he'd done, close quote. Were those Donald or were they just, uh, you know, charlatans who had read about the case, uh, you know, pretending to see? I don't know. Skeptics have made many claims about the Battersea poltergeist haunting. Many have uh, accused Shirley of doing it herself or in collusion with other members of her family. And some of the things absolutely could have been staged or faked. I mean, you can, you know, sleight of hand and stage magic, you can do a lot. But so many witnesses saw and heard things with their own eyes and ears, things like furniture moving, objects flying around, rapping, uh, tapping, knocking, voices, booms, loud noises, pots and pans flying out of empty rooms. It's hard to imagine Shirley pulling this off for 12 years in front of everyone and not ever being caught. The incident with the actor Jeremy Spencer, that makes me kind of wonder if that particular thing wasn't the work of a teenage girl trying to meet her idol, right? Her heartthrob, her celebrity crush. You know, she writes a letter claiming to be Donald, saying that she has to meet him in person or he'll be harmed. I mean, you know, what better way to meet your heartthrob if you're the man of your dreams for a young girl than to have a ghost threaten him if you can't meet him? She never did meet him, of course. Shirley's handwriting appears different than Donald's handwriting, if you look at it. Although some handwriting experts, some, have said that they spot things that seem to indicate Shirley may have wrote the notes uh, and not Donald. However, many notes appeared when Shirley was not even living in the house. So that kind of, you know, I don't know, (laughs) kind of puts that theory away. So did some paranormal incidents happen when she wasn't even living there. All right. What are some theories overall about this poltergeist from Battersea. One, maybe it really was the ghost of Louis Charles haunting Shirley. I personally don't accept this because, you know, so much of the supposed Dauphin story was fake and his language was affected, meaning, meaning fake, made up. His French, French, Frenchness in his writing was clearly fake. Second theory, maybe it really was a poltergeist. I can accept this probability. And if it was a poltergeist, you probably know my belief that poltergeists are not, in fact, spirits of the dead, uh, of people who have died, but rather demons or evil spirits pretending, mimicking uh, ghosts of the dead in order to taunt and torment people. Another idea, maybe it was Shirley playing tricks, but a poltergeist as well. In other words, maybe she did some things, faked them for fun, but maybe there was a real poltergeist too. Like the infield haunting, where the two girls admitted to doing about 2% of the, of the haunting as a joke. I see this as possible. Some parts, like the infatuation with Jeremy Spencer, the actor, would make sense if it's a typical teenage girl you know, doing the alleged haunting. But other parts, like multiple witnesses seeing furniture move and objects fly, that's just beyond the work of a teenage girl. And other theories, maybe it was all her playing tricks. And again, I, I don't think that's possible. I've mentioned before the idea that some investigators believe that poltergeists could be physical manifestations of the energy of the pubescent center of the case. Again, almost every poltergeist haunting has a a young person going through puberty. In other words, a person going through puberty has intense emotions and uh, overabundance of hormones, hormonal changes, their body's changing, lots of drama in life. Perhaps that energy can somehow manifest physically, especially when that person wants something uh, to happen badly enough. Maybe Shirley began wanting something badly. Attention, money, being recognized, being respected. I don't know, something. Maybe she started faking Donald in the beginning, but all of her energy and emotions somehow sparked him into life as kind of a um, projection of her own self. This explanation doesn't even have to be supernatural. It could be metaphysical. And by metaphysical, I mean a real scientific uh, uh, phenomenon that we just 
don't know about yet. Kind of like bacteria before germ theory, people didn't know about them, you know. I suppose I could accept this explanation as well. I kind of want poltergeists to be real because I love horror. And, you know, I do this podcast and these videos. But I could accept a medical, uh, sorry, metaphysical explanation. Another theory is that it was a family conspiracy that not just Shirley, but the whole family that kind of got out of hand, that the entire family played the role of Donald and, you know, coordinate, coordinated their efforts to trick people. But I mean, all the witnesses <laughs> that saw this, were they involved also? Was it this huge conspiracy of hundreds of people and none of them have ever told the truth? That seems very unlikely. Also, many phenomena occurred when the family was all together in one room and being observed. So, you know, they would have to be like a professional troupe of the world's best stage magicians to pull this off, but they weren't. They were just a simple working class family. Wally was just a, a subway driver, you know? I, I don't believe that's possible. Could it have been a giant mass hallucination? Mass hallucinations do occur, but the sheer variety and number of people who came and went in that house, I can't see, I can't imagine that could all be a mass hallucination. So what's the best explanation, in my opinion, poltergeist? <laughs> this case really disturbs me. It really shakes me. Because 12 years of having your home, your life invaded by an unseen entity that has it out for you, and you have absolutely no control over it. Nothing you do makes it go away. And for no apparent reason. There's no evidence that Shirley dabbled in the occult or anything like that. She was just a normal girl. Why did Don, uh, Donald choose Shirley and her family? You know, what did they do? Why did he pick on them? Why did it remain so long? This case overall indeed bears all the marks of the classic poltergeist cases. It, it clearly was a poltergeist. It has some unique features that really push it over the edge, but what do you think? I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're a regular listener or viewer, you know that I do accept the possibility of the reality of the paranormal. I've said more than once that I believe poltergeists are not actually ghosts, or rather demons pretending to be ghosts. And as I've said more than once, also, I wouldn't be doing this podcast if I didn't believe in the paranormal. So there you have it, the Battersea Poltergeist, an amazing, amazing haunting that still shakes people to this day. And uh, the most documented, most well-documented haunting in history that I know of, also the longest poltergeist haunting that I know of in history. So tonight, if your living room chair moves across the room by itself, well, I hate to be the one to tell you, but you have a poltergeist. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And as always, sleep well if you can. <laughs>